So today I want to do like an overview of all the features that make Stargate unique because as you know, we have many rollups these days. Many of them just announced, but all of them have different characteristics. So the question is, what is it that makes a Starknet unique? And hopefully also to convince you that the Starknet might be like the best scaling solution for Ethereum. I'm getting this wrong with the clicker. All right. So the first uh, feature that I want to highlight about Starknet is its architecture. Because it's fundamentally different from Ethereum, and because that reason is very different from many alternative layer ones as well. And it's different from other type of rollups like optimistic rollups. So just so you have an idea of, uh, of a regular flow of transaction, when you start a transaction, it goes to a sequencer that is in charge of validate, bundle, and execute them using the Starknet OS. That execution generates a trace that goes to the prover, in this case, Sharp. And the prover creates this cryptographic proof of the integrity of the computation, basically to validate that that execution was correct. And now the proof is sent to layer one, to Ethereum. So we have a smart contract that we call the verifier that just takes this cryptographic proof and just verify its validity. Once it does that, it actually calls another smart contract called this, the fact registry. That is where uh, layer one applications can query to see if a, if a cryptographic proof has been validated. Once the proof has been validated, now the difference in the state as a result of executing all these layer two transaction is sent to Ethereum, right? This is the rollup part, the data availability. And it's sent to another smart contract that we call a Starknet Core that actually holds that information and how the state changes over time. So when you have a full node for a Starknet, in this case, uh, one example will be Pathfinder, the full node is able to recreate the full state of a Starknet just by reading this smart contract on Ethereum. Uh, and that's basically one of the security assumptions, right? So even if a Starknet goes offline, that data availability, that um, latest state of the rollup will be preserved on Ethereum. But because creating a proof takes, takes a while, uh, so the full node is also listening for transactions adding to what's called the pending block. So that way you can have a, a faster feedback if you're developing a layer two application to know if your transaction at least was added to the sequencer you will have to wait longer until the cryptographic proof associated with execution is validated on L1. Every blockchain tries to guarantee computational integrity, and uh, Starknet as a rollup also tries to do the same thing, but in a different way. But before we see the differences between how uh, Ethereum and Starknet uh, guarantee computational integrity, we have to understand what that is. So computational integrity means that if I give you an output, how do I convince you that it's the result of the execution of uh, a program with certain input? In the case of a, of a blockchain, the same problem will be classified. I, if I give you a new state of a network or of a blockchain, how can you convince you that it's the result of executing a certain smart contract with certain input given by a transaction. So let's see how Ethereum and Starknet solve the same issue. So on Ethereum, and this is the case with many blockchains with similar architecture, the solution for the computational integrity is basically to replay the same transaction on every node of the network, right? So every computer independently will verify that they get the same output by replicating this, the same transaction with a smart contract. So as you can see, intuitively, this is not very performant because you replicate the same transaction over and over independently. The Starknet solved this in a different way. So basically, you only execute a transaction once on the sequencer. What it gets executed multiple times is the verification of the cryptographic proof that happens on layer one. So basically on a Starknet, you execute only once and you verify everywhere. 
Now the question is, is this much more performant to what Ethereum is doing to just redoing or re-executing the same thing over and over? Well, it is because the, the difficulty of the, of the amount of resources required to verify a proof, it has a polylogarithmic relationship with the execution of the underlying transaction. So as you can see on the chart of the left, you can see like the big difference between the blue line, which is what is the effort of executing a transaction, versus the red line is what is the effort to verify the computation uh, that is coming from the cryptographic proof. So the bigger the distance between the two, the more efficient the system is. So as you can see intuitively, as, as we're able to add more transactions on a single cryptographic proof, the more efficient the system is. Which is an interesting feature about Starknet that over time, the more people use it, the more efficient it will get because that distance is just going to increase. Of course, it's in the name. Starknet uses Starks to generate these cryptographic proofs. But you probably also hear about SNARK. It's a different type of um, CK technology to also generate cryptographic proofs. So if you want to compare the two of them, if you see like the, the time or the effort for verifying a proof, in the case of a Stark, it's polylogarithmic. In the case of a Snark, it's actually constant. So it doesn't depend on how complex the computation the, or the transaction is. The case of the proof size, which is the thing that is sent to layer one, so it has an intrinsic cost in gas. For a Stark, it's in the hundred of kilobytes. For a Snark, instead, it's only 288 bytes. So the question is, if it's a Snark is so much more efficient, why do we even bother to use a Stark on a Starknet? And the reason is because these last two properties are very important. Uh, on a Stark, you don't need a trusted setup. It's basically to create this, uh, this secret that you use to feed the system, but you need to be careful to dispose of this secret after that ceremony, the trusted setup. Otherwise, the system gets compromised. So with the SNARK, you will have to trust that, the, that this setup has done correctly. With the Stark, you don't have to. And also the other important benefit is that the Starks are quantum secure, while the Snarks are not. And this is going to be important in a few years when the first quantum computers with enough power comes online. Uh, system based on the SNARK might, be, might get compromised, while well, Ethereum itself will get compromised, but system based on the Stark will not. So clearly we're thinking more about the long term. But of course we have the trade-off about the, the size and the computation complexity. We, because we are aware of this trade-off, we have been working on improving um, the, the size of the proof compared to how many transactions we're able to, to bundle in that proof. And for that, we have implemented what's called recursive proof that I'm not going to go into detail right now. But you can watch this very interesting video from a start, a Starknet CC back in Paris uh, by Yael Dowie that explains in very detail how this recursive proof actually improved the efficiency of the system. The other interesting feature about Starknet is that you're going to get a can abstraction, something that you don't have on Ethereum or in other blockchains. And on a can abstraction, if you first focus on Ethereum, we have two types of wallets. So we have the externally owned account, which is like a combination of a key and the, and the assets that your, your wallet holds. You can also, of course, create a wallet using a smart contract, which is, for example, a multisig. That's what it is. But the main issue is that these smart contract wallets are second class uh, citizens in the system compared to the externally owned accounts. So there are things that you cannot do with a smart contract account, like a multisig, that you can only do with an externally owned account. In the case of a Starnet, everything Every wallet is actually implemented as a smart contract, which implies a separation of the role of the signer and the thing that holds your assets. And so this a smart contract is called user accounts. The only difference with any regular smart contract is they have to follow a specific interface, kind of like the same way that an ERC-20 is a smart contract that follows a specific interface as well. 
and stagnant this type of smart contract wallets on the user accounts are first class citizens in the system. And this has important uh, consequences. The consequence is that it brings many benefits uh, to, to Stagnet. First of all, with a kind of fraction, you, now you can use the dedicated hardware of your smartphone to sign transactions, to create secure private keys, because now you can generate this seed for the private key in a more uh, effective way. You can sign transactions with your hardware. And this is only possible because with account construction, you can support many different elliptic curves to sign transactions and even different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, algorithms that are not elliptic curves to sign a transaction. So it's super flexible. It also enables the social recovery of accounts. I think it's been discussed before here at Starnet. But an uh, easy way to think about that is that now you no longer have to store the, the seed phrase. And if you lose it, you lose everything. Now you can define guardians like your family and friends that if you ever lose access to your wallet, you can perform like an offline authentication with your friends and family, and they can allow you to regain access uh, to, to your user account, which is a, a big win in terms of accessibility. It also enables session keys for gaming. For me, one of the most interesting ones, because the last thing that I know when I'm playing a game is that every time that I have to pick up loot from a monster, is to sign a transaction, right? It's gonna break the whole flow of the game. With a session key, you can have a dedicated private key that is valid for a short period of time, has very limited access, but it will allow you to focus, for example, on the game, and under the hood, that extra keys will be in charge of signing these transactions as they go. And you can have more advanced, like a fraud monitoring. Like, if you ever fall victim for a scam because you interacted with the incorrect smart contract, you can define like a second signer for your user account that is basically monitoring what you're doing. If it detects you're trying to interact with a well-known scam address, it will stop the transaction. Similar how to how your bank is monitoring your transaction with your credit card. If they see something suspicious, they will suspend access in, in order to protect you. You can define spending limits for on-the-go keys. This is important when you use your phone as a, as a wallet because even though it's now it's more secure from a digital point of view because you can use the hardware, your phone is prone to be lost or stolen. So now you can define, okay, maybe for the same user account, I don't have restriction with my hardware wallet at home, but I have restriction on how much I can spend with the same wallet with the keys of my phone. Similar to with your debit card, you have a limit of how much you can withdraw from an ATM. And then bank is supposed the limit also to protect you. And finally, also, we have multiples. So if you have a flow that requires multiple uh, transactions, instead of signing one by one, you can complete the flow and just sign the last transactions to complete all of them at once. If you want to learn more about a kind of fraction, I think I found this talk from Julian, which is here as well. Very interesting because not only talks about all these benefits, but it has very handy diagrams that you can use. I'm, a, I'm more of a visual learner that helped me a lot to understand this. I want to talk also about the bridge that Starknet has, but before I can get there, we have to talk about the cross-layer communication, because once you understand that, bridges are easy to understand. So on a Starknet, you're able to send a message from L2 to L1 and from L1 to L2. I'm gonna show you here only the L2 to L1 flow as an example, but the flow and inverse is fairly similar. So if you want to send a message to L1 to L2, you, you can start a transaction, and, and in the smart contract, the source smart contract, let's say, you can invoke a specific sys call, I think this call is called send message to L1, and Basically, the, the flow will be the same as with any other transaction. It's just now when the system sends the state difference to the Starknet core to finalize, uh, let's say, the rollup process, it also includes the messages you're trying to send to L1. These messages are a store. I mean, the hash of the message is a store in the Starknet core, but also the message itself is emitted as an event. So that would allow any application to react to new messages and only the targeted smart contract because this, this, the source of smart contract would have defined, okay, this message is for a specific contract on layer one. 
Only the target smart contract will be able to read the message and extract the information and that way uh, closes the loop for the message and is considered to be delivered. This last operation can be done permissionless so anyone can trigger it because at the end of the day, uh, it's just about retrieving the message. You have to pay the gas on Ethereum to do that. So once you understand this L2 to L1 communication, understanding how the token, uh, so how the bridge work is very easy. You will require to have two smart contracts, one on L2, one on L1 for your token. So let's say you want to withdraw some money, some tokens from L2 to L1. So you will use the same syscall send tokens to L1, and you will specify not only what is the address of the, of the smart contract of the token on L1, but also what is the address of the person you want to receive the funds. It follows the same flow, but now the message on L1 will get read by the, the token smart contract on L1, and now the funds, let's say, could be an unlock of tokens or could be the new tokens get minted, but has how you communicate to smart contracts to send tokens from one end to another. Another feature of a StarkNet is its time to finality. The, the time that you consider that your transaction is completely final and verifiable. So for comparison, in Ethereum, it's about six minutes. So it's the time of one epoch that you consider a transaction is, is completely done. In the case of a StarkNet right now on mainnet, it's around 10 hours. Uh, the time that it takes from a transaction that it starts to the proof to be verified on, on layer one. This, this, of course, will improve over time as we improve the, the sequencer. And actually, as we get more traffic, because one of the limitations is that we need to bundle enough transactions to make it uh, cost effective to you know, send this state difference and the cryptographic proof to L1. But if you compare that, for example, to optimistic rollup, it's quite an advantage. In optimistic rollup, you need a full week to be able to withdraw funds, basically to uh, fully confirm uh, a transaction. If you're building an uh, application on L2, you don't have to wait 10 hours to get confirmation. You can also listen of it for events coming from the sequencer of transactions added to a block. And that way, you can have like a soft confirmation of a transaction being like confirmed, at least at the sequencer level. You will have to wait longer to get like, the cryptographic uh, verification on L1. Also unique to StarNet is that even though in Cairo we don't have classes, we don't have inheritance, on a StarNet we actually have classes and instances. So when you want to deploy a, a smart contract, you actually first have to declare a smart contract class that you actually put on or deploy to, to the network. And only after you have, you have declared the, the smart contract class, you can use a special syscall from any other smart contract to deploy an instance of that class. So you will have to provide the arguments for the constructor. So now when the instance is deployed, the instance is really what we consider to be the smart contract, the thing that you interact with, that you invoke, that you call. Um, you can also de uh, declare a smart contract class without any instance if you want to create a library. Because with another syscall, the, the library call, you can actually execute code from this smart contract class, but in the context of the caller, right? So similar to a delegate call in Ethereum. So it's an easy way or a common way to implement a reusable library on a StarNet. Finally, probably the feature that you know the most is Cairo, Caroline. So uh, Cairo has a great feature is that it allows you to create provable programs, right? That is a, a, a very important feature of the language, but it has other, let's say, uh, characteristics that it makes it different from things like Solidity, is that the basic type is, is a felt. And when you have a variable of type felt, you can store uh, a number whose maximum value is a prime number that can be stored in 251 bits. So you can see that it's very different from Ethereum that you had a uint to 56. Here, the maximum number is actually a prime number. You can, and that has some uh, consequences in terms of how arithmetic works. 
You don't have inheritance. That's the difference as well with Solidity. There's no extent, so you have to implement some kind of a delegate pattern when you say, oh, just import individual functions on your smart contract. You can do non-deterministic programming using hints, also very unique to Cairo. And if you look at the syntax of, of Cairo, at least in the version 0.x that we have right now, 0.10, it's kind of similar to Python because the hints are also Python. But the goal is with Cairo 1 uh, in the future is to look more like Rust when it comes to the syntax at least. And finally, you can actually use Cairo outside of the blockchain. It's not limited to Starknet. That is, I think, an area that is not well explored right now. But I think that some interesting use cases might come up in the future by the fact that you can use it on your own. That's it. That's a high-level overview of Starnet. I hope that was uh, informative. Thank you.